we, for weeks, Elliot, we've been talking about the success, really, from a communications perspective of the Conservatives' messaging when it comes to the carbon tax or the, the price on carbon vis-a-vis -vis the home heating announcement, for example, and sort of what we've seen in public opinion polls about public sentiment around that. But this seems uh, different, right? This is a sort of, uh, this also involves Ukraine. Do you anticipate that they will be getting some blowback for the position they've taken, taken here, pardon me? Yeah, I suspect so. I mean, this is really mystifying, if I'm being honest. I mean, to, to think that a, a conservative party would be against a free trade agreement with Ukraine, who is in the middle of a war, when you think back to sort of the traditional roots of conservative party, you know, when you think back to the 80s and, and Brian Mulroney and other and other leaders, I mean, even Stephen Harper, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about, actually. Um, and I and I I don't even think it's I mean Canadians should be upset about this. Ukrainian Canadians are probably very upset about this, but Canadian businesses should be very upset about this. Ukraine is about to undergo probably one of the largest reconstruction efforts we've seen in decades. Um, countries are partnering with Ukraine so that in that reconstruction they can be they can be helping Canadian companies because of sort of this sort of slow trade deal. Uh, essentially, what the Conservatives are saying is we don't really want Canadian companies to be a part of that. We don't think it's very important for Canadian companies to be a part of that. That doesn't sound like a lot of common sense, which is something that Pierre, uh, Pierre Polio has been talking about. And so, so to me, this is just as a, a mystifying decision. Carbon pricing, the, the language that is used in the agreement, is table stakes at the international level. Everybody is, is getting involved in how you price carbon. The ideology piece that Pierre Polyev has assigned to this is ridiculous, and I think it's sort of getting in the way of just actually just smart policy. I'll just quickly say the text of the deal doesn't commit any of the parties to a carbon no. tax. It just says both sides are expected, and I'll quote here, to promote carbon pricing and measures to mitigate carbon leakage risks. And what do you think is behind this? Is it just this like ideological adherence to anti-carbon pricing, anti-carbon tax, or is there like... You have seen on the right, particularly in the U.S., a fraction where Russia and Ukraine are considered like less support for Ukraine than before. Is that coming to Canada? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's a terrible mistake on their part. I think that both on the substance and on the politics, right? So this, for this, from the substance point of view, I think Elliot's right. I mean, there, there's a lot there that, that would be important for Ukraine. But just from a political optics point of view, I, they're going to have a terrible time trying to explain this. Um, and as you know, that, there's that old adage in politics that when you're explaining, you're losing. Um, and, and they have, a, they, I think probably there are some very, very significant Ukrainian Canadian communities in this country. And I Maybe they've decided that that they're uh, far enough ahead in the prairies that that they don't need those votes anymore. I don't. I'm not sure what that's about. But it it just it looks terrible. They're going to not be able to explain it. And uh, and if it was about this kind of rigid adherence to this anti-carbon pricing uh, position that they have, um, I think they've. I just they've, they've made a huge misstep. All those opposed to the motion will please rise. MPs voting to send Bill C-57, the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act, to committee. Conservatives voted against the deal because it contains language on carbon pricing. Justin Trudeau decided not to go ahead with a trade deal. He decided to go ahead with a carbon tax deal. And I really think that it speaks to how pathologically obsessed Trudeau is with the carbon tax. That he, well, while the knife is at the throat of Ukrainians, he would use that to impose his carbon tax ideology on those poor people. Well, that provoked a pointed response from Liberals today. It's completely absurd. I don't believe Canadians buy into their arguments. It's appalling. It's, it's utterly appalling. And this is part of a larger pattern of, of behavior by the Conservatives, where they don't support Ukraine. All right, we're going to discuss all of this with the Power Panel. Tim Powers is the chair of Summa Strategies. Jordan Leichnitz is the Canada Program Manager for the Frederick Ebert Foundation. Sherelle Evelyn is the Managing Editor of The Hill Times. And Amanda Alvaro is a political commentator. All right, Tim, uh, first, um, we just talked to Roman Waschuk, who mm -hmm. was Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. He's now the business ombudsperson over there, an independent officer uh, that, that handles disputes uh, for Ukrainian businesses and the government. Ukraine agreed to go to carbon pricing when they set and path their plans to join the European Union. This is something the democratic government wants. Canada is not imposing it. 
What do you make of what we've seen on this over the last 24 hours? <laughs> What was Seamus's word? There's all appalling, David. Yeah. It's all well. Look, the, the the language both from the conservative leader and the liberals in response is a bit too dramatic. So to get to it, I mean, I, I see where the conservatives may have seen an opening, uh, but sometimes you shouldn't take every opening. I, they saw the opening, I guess, when there was a presentation to committee, and one of the global affairs officials said uh, that the carbon pricing mentioned in there was something that was aspirational. Well, saying aspirational to the Conservatives right now is saying, all right, there's the piñata, I can whack at it. Um, I think the Conservative leader and the Conservatives have found that they can make good political points domestically going after this, but... But it's false. But, it, but, it, well, if yeah, you were going yeah. to let me... Yeah, sorry, 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 I apologize. I was going to agree <laughs> that, yes, sometimes you can go a little too yeah. far chasing political points at home. I don't think they're really going to suffer too much around this because uh, it's a, a trade agreement and they're making a point. Maybe they're trying to raise some money off of it. Mm. But the danger politically for the conservatives is if you do this all the time, you are going to lose a little bit of credibility. Right. So, so Amanda, on this, right, I mean, Ukraine has four big national objectives right now to win the war, to rebuild their country, to join NATO and to join the European mm -hmm. Union. To join the European Union, you need carbon pricing, and Ukraine has agreed to move in that direction as recently as mm -hmm. five, six years ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So it's just not true to say that Canada has forced them to do this, right? Yes. I mean, the, the only person who is pathologically obsessed is Polyev himself with his talking points. At, at any particular moment on wedge politics. And that's exactly what this is. And in my opinion, it's the worst kind of politics. I mean, th these are the conditions that the Ukraine government itself has asked for, a country under siege, fighting for its freedom. Uh, these were the conditions, these were the, the policies that they are looking to enact with Canada. To deny them of that is one thing, but beyond that, to actually twist it to your advantage, to use it as a political talking point is the worst kind of politics. And that's exactly what Polyev and the Conservatives did today. So, so Jordan, you know, is this just an opportunity that Mr. Polyev and the Conservatives are seizing on? Or could there be potentially be a cost to them for doing something like this? Because you, you saw, like, yeah. O'Regan is like, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed, is almost like the tone. <laughs> but is there a potential <laughs> blowback from this? Sure. This is weird, right? <laughs> like, they're, they're making an issue uh, of a, a free trade agreement. Like, we also should remember that Stephen Harper first at first initiated back in 2015. This is, a, this is a free trade agreement that initially came out of a desire of a conservative government to push back Russian influence and support Ukrainians. Mm. Um, and so now to have them argue that this is somehow about some covert way of expanding carbon pricing when on the face of it, it's clearly not true. I think I think they're just way too deep in the bunker. And I do think this stuff can hurt them because, frankly, they just sound offside with where most Canadians are at. It doesn't meet the nod test for most uh, folks who are listening to this. And I think it's also dangerous for them because it opens the door to questions about whether or not they're actually really fully on board in terms of supporting Ukraine. Sherelle, where do you see it? Well, kind of to jump off of Jordan saying, you, in terms of the, where it, what doors it opens, I mean, look down south, south across the border. Um, there are, you know, lots of, there's a lot of movement, a lot, especially in the Republican side of the U.S. politics of people pulling back from Ukraine, not wanting to support them, not wanting to invest in, you know, in helping them fight against Russia. So there does become, so it's, so you kind of wonder, is it, is it a risk that they're taking or is, do they see it as a potential opportunity to kind of get that, to kind of get into that side of things? I mean, it, it is kind of interesting to see the shift in the de actual debate on this bill um, prior to uh, the uh, October 26th announcement, I believe it was October 26th, of the carve out for, you know, home right. oil and yeah. things like that. Um, conservatives in the House during second reading debate on this bill had been making, some of them had been making some really thoughtful, um, uh, maybe useful contributions to the debate. They were talking about things that they wanted to see probed further. They were talking about where I thought it might have gone, you know, in terms of uh, wanting to see more in terms of resources and energy exports and things like that. And that might have been the sticking point. But it became, it became very, very clear after that October 26 point of that, no, this is about the carbon price. And then you started hearing uh, 
someone piece sprinkling the word that you know this is a woke bill and things like that and then it just kind of all fell apart mm -hmm. and you just be, and you just knew that you know you knew where it was going and it, they and for some reason is like well it opened this door for people to say well you're not supportive of ukraine yeah, I, I look. I don't think it'll have any immediate damage because uh, I think a lot of their audience will appreciate, as uh, difficult as the truth may be here, uh, that they have gone after something uh, that has the words carbon pricing in it, and they expect them to do that. But I, I think there is a lesson in there about learning when to go after the red rag from the bull and learning when to stay away from the bull so you don't get trampled and uh, and they have to they have to learn those lessons I, I don't think there's anything wrong with raising the issue and asking the questions I think if you take it a little too far and I'll take a little bit of umbrage with my friend Amanda I mean Pierre Polyev and the Prime Minister sometimes both do that on issues that they believe yield political success for them and when both of them do it it doesn't usually yield the political success that it should or no, they would look, like look, it to. Look, I get that. And, and Amanda, in politics, people can go, you know, over the line in, in all directions. But on something like this, like, you're seeing the political consensus maybe fraying a little bit in the United States when it comes to Ukraine, right? And, like, the military support for Israel went through the House. They're still struggling uh, on, on what to do in terms of helping uh, President Zelensky and his people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we start putting into the conversation facts, sorry, things that just aren't true mm -hmm. about Canada's yeah. intentions and Canada's actions when it comes to Ukraine, do, does that not risk undermining the consensus that exists in this country to help them in the fight against Putin? Of course. And that's what becomes so dangerous about it. I mean, it's one thing to, to use your talking points or there's a certain amount of, of rhetoric that's involved in politics. And we can all agree that that's what keeps us having a healthy debate. Mm -hmm. But it is another thing to flat out lie, to allege uh, that it would impose a carbon tax on the people of Ukraine is different than having a, a concern or an issue with carbon pricing in, in Canada. To flat out lie about what the treaty is supposed to do undermines their credibility as a party for sure, but it also starts to see doubt amongst people who are listening, right? If you're listening to those words from somebody who you believe to be a credible source of information, you might start believing them. So I take a, a lot of offense when somebody who has the responsibility to Canadians to convey the truth uses an opportunity at the microphone to deliver that kind of untruth. I think that that's scary, dangerous territory. So, so Jordan, um you know, words, words are important, former Newfoundland Premier Roger Grimes used to say in the legislature uh, back when I, I was covering his government. And, and, and today, for example, unrelated to this, but to the importance of like being clear and also being cautious, Mr. Polyev's first question today in question period asked the Prime Minister to update on the terror Wrist, the terrorist attack at the Rainbow yeah. Bridge. We just hear from the New York governor, Kathy Hochul, saying there's no evidence of terrorism. It's two local men, two local people, I don't know if they're men or not, who died in this, and everyone take the temperature down. There is an importance to what you say in public. I, I measure what I say every day on the air here, and I'm nowhere near as important as the people who hold office. In so what, what's your sense on, on the implications of this sort of an approach? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think when it comes to the question of, of how to react when things are unfolding rapidly, uh, it's not a race. And, and sometimes yeah. politicians get it wrong in a rush to be the first to comment. Um, you know, I, I think it's maybe not without coincidence that, that Fox News was also out very early on sure calling was. this a terrorist attack. So, it, you know, it sort of makes you wonder what's on in the, uh, in the OLO. But I think... I think that when, um, you know, when incidents like this are unfolding, it's really incumbent upon public officials of all parties to exercise caution. Um, I think it's totally appropriate to ask for an update in the House. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a normal Absolutely. and a, a good thing to do. But I think, it, you know, it's, it's risky to characterize it early on. And, and in this case, he appears to have gotten it wrong. I think every Canadian understands uh, what's at stake when we talk about a potential terrorist attack at the Canada-U.S. border. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, but I was immediately thrown back to oh, post 9-11 mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the question mm -hmm. of whether uh, attackers might have come from Canada. These are massively consequential uh, issues for security, for trade, um, and for, for Canadian safety. So, yeah, I think you have to be really careful. I think uh, he had a moment today uh, of lack of care, and that should be worrying. Okay. Cheryl, quick last word from you, and we've got to take a break. 
Well, I would disagree. I mean, I'm a writer. Words mean things. And so we try to use them, you know, in a circumspect fashion. I, I did notice in while, you know, Mr. Polyev did try to, you know, give a, an element of, you know, that statesmanlike um, behavior in in the house today he did still also encroach uh, couch that in you know you know what is the prime minister going to do as pardon me for reading it uh, to immediately bring home security for canadians so he still managed to squeeze his his right. talking points into it yeah and look we just don't know it could be something more than it appears but certainly the governor of new york who has better information than we do is telling everyone to calm down